reporting. So, should Ukraine look east or look west and can it survive intact? Well, Yulia Rusanova from Oxford Analytica specialises in the politics and economy of Russia and Ukraine. She joins us now from Oxford and here in the studio with me is Elena Korosteleva, who runs the Global Europe Centre at Kent University here in the UK. Elena, first of all, let me come to you. Um, I mean, there is that big question that has been asked now in the past few days. Can Ukraine stay together? Is that the right question or the wrong question to be asking? Thank you. Uh, well, this is a difficult question. In my opinion, and as our research actually shows, uh, it is less about the tale of two Ukraines, of two countries. Uh, the situation currently, I think, is about simple human security, basically about uh, the, the, the concerns about job prospects, about uh, social benefits, about the future for, uh, uh, for, for the children and so on. So if this could be assured, be it either by the European Union or Russia in that sense, then um, th that would be the way Ukraine will go. Um, but that you get, the impression, but you the, get the impression if you ask that question to young people in Kiev, they're going to say, well, I think that probably the West will give me that security. And if you ask young people maybe in Donetsk, they'll mm -hmm. give you a different answer. Well, uh, th th there are uh, certain explanations to that because, after all, the eastern Ukraine is far greater involved, for example, in trade relations with, uh, with Russia. And if we just look at basic figures, for example, about one-third of all export and import f uh, from Ukraine actually goes to the Commonwealth countries. And uh, about 25% on average actually goes to Russia. So therefore, if Russia is removed out of the equation, of course people fear about their future. And therefore, you see, for Western Ukraine, the situation is a little bit simple in the sense that they, they, they perhaps, uh, they in far greater touch and communication with the EU. And that could possibly change their opinion. So it's about human security. If this could be assured, uh, I'm sure then, uh, the situation, public opinion, could be managed. Y Yulia Rosanova, let me come to you in Oxford. Um, d first of all, do you agree with that analysis? And secondly, what do you think Russia's next move is going to be? Uh, as, as far as the Ukrainians pull it to begin with, I think much will depend on the actions of the current parliament. Uh, they have recently passed a law which annulled an earlier bill making Russian language an official language in the Russian-dominated regions of Ukraine. Uh, that was interpreted by many of ethnic Russians as infringing in, upon their liberties. Uh, if more laws of this nature are passed, I think that might spur m more popular discontent in the southeast of the country. Uh, now, as far as Russia's uh, next, step, ne next steps go, uh, it's facing a difficult choice at the moment. On the one hand, it's certainly not in their geopolitical interests to have Ukraine forge closer ties with the EU. And moreover, it's coming under greater pressure from its domestic constituency, the Russians in Russia, as well as the Russians living in Ukraine, uh, which make up about 20 to 25 percent of the total population, uh, pressure to intervene. At the same time, Russia is not interested in having an escalation of violence in Ukraine right next to its borders, uh, nor is there an obvious leadership figure which could be installed, a pro-Russian leadership figure which could be installed at this point. Uh, Yanukovych, uh, the president, has lost much of his credibility not only with the West, but also with the East. So I think what Russia might tend to do instead is apply non-military pressure, in other words, uh, economic sanctions, uh, raise gas prices that Ukraine imports from Russia, and wait until the economy deteriorates to the extent where the people themselves, um, not only in the East, uh, but maybe in Kiev as well, will be looking for closer connection with Russia. Uh, that is quite a gamble, isn't it? You are, you, you, that is sort of, you know, quiet bullying into submission, which could go the other way with people saying, look at what Russia is doing. And, you know, Russia, which has had a fair, its diplomacy in recent months has been extremely successful, you know, whether on the subject of Syria and chemical weapons and whatever else. Um, it would, this would, could be a potential setback uh, for Vladimir Putin. Well, it certainly would be perceived a setback, uh, as a setback from the Western point of view, and I'm sure Russia would come under substantial Western criticism if it were to implement strict, strict sanctions against Ukraine. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that if Ukraine were to integrate itself closer to the EU, sign the association agreement, for example, 
its borders with the EU would become much more porous as far as trade goes. And Russia would argue that it needs to protect its own space, the customs union, um, from inflow of European goods that would be competing with domestic producers, hence justifying additional economic sanctions or restrictions, if you will. Okay, let, let, Eleni, we, we have seen in kind of, you know, in the Arab Spring, it's one thing to overthrow a government, that can be achieved, you know, we've seen it in Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, wherever else that you care to mention. It's much more difficult to bring in a stable alternative. What are the potential directions now that Ukraine takes now that Yanukovych has fallen? That's actually very true, that uh, to overthrow the government is obviously it's a little bit easier than actually to build and stabilize the country, take the country out of um, the chaos. What is important at this stage is actually to stop politicizing the situation of choice, the West and the East. This standoff could be resolved in a sense when, as I mentioned, that, for example, the human, basic human security needs are addressed, when stability is brought back in the streets. But, and this yeah. could be addressed. Now, there are obviously immediate tasks. We have, for example, coalition government that needs to be built that would actually regain legitimacy uh, uh, amongst the, the people. And then, of course, prepare the country for elections. That's when, obviously, the, the stability and the future sustainability could be achieved. I mean, do you think uh, there, is, that there is a person around whom people could, you know, all sides could agree and coalesce and support could build? I think they've had enough uh, personalised politics in Ukraine. Yeah. I think what is important in this moment of time is actually for, for Ukraine actually to have a co coalition, a united uh, perhaps parliament that would try to lead the, the, the country towards elections and then hopefully by then there will be some identifiable uh, parties with party leaders who would lead the country towards perhaps more parliamentary future rather than the presidential one because but yet again obviously the culture is very difficult to change. Okay yeah. there we have to leave it. Elena, Yulia in Oxford both of you thank you very much indeed uh, maybe you'll come back and talk to us again about this subject because I think it's I think it's one that we're going to be returning to uh, quite a lot in the coming uh, days and weeks thanks so much thank you now for the very latest on what's happening to Ukraine do visit our website that's at bbc.com forward slash Ukraine where you can find all the latest video pictures and analysis <laughs>